All right. Well, thanks everyone for sticking around for my presentation. So I just got a couple of slides to go over, uh, and then the rest will just be me kind of fumbling around inside of Jenkins. Now, you might have been wondering, is this title clickbait? No, not clickbait. We will run GitHub Actions on Jenkins at the end of this presentation. But first, let me tell you a little bit about the Jenkins standard library that makes it possible. So it's a shared library, and it's open source and free to use. It has tests, example jobs, Javadoc documentation, all the good stuff. And its goals are to provide abstraction, solve very common CICD problems, and provide features not implemented in the community and workarounds for some of Jenkins quirks. And don't mind the lack of stars. It's a very new project, and you are among the first to hear about it. But why not create a plugin? Well, the Jenkins plugin ecosystem provides many powerful building blocks that you can use in your pipeline to do a certain task but they typically don't extract away complex problems. And they often require some boilerplate code before they can do any heavy lifting. And if plugins are like bash commands, then the Jenkins standard library is like the pipe operator, right? And extended functionality is great, but you know, does, does this actually solve some kind of problem? So in my day-to-day -day work, I meet many teams that are use, utilizing Jenkins as a CI CD tool. And I noticed most of these teams are building the same internal tooling in their shared library. Things like a logging utility, wrappers around PIP and NPM. So we are all constantly developing the same solutions in secret. And that's kind of the problem I'm trying to solve. So the Jenkins standard library, it gives teams a single place to iterate on common tooling they need. And taking inspiration from Python's all batteries included standard library, I want to provide utilities that allow teams to focus more on their application pipelines and less on yak shape. So the shell step is extremely important building block that is used in almost every pipeline, right? But that doesn't mean it couldn't be improved. It has features requested by the community. It has very common use cases and some quirky behavior. So let's jump into the first demo and see what improvements we've made on the shell step. All right. So here's a pipeline job. It has our library imported and it has a couple little helper classes. Mainly we're just gonna be looking at the, the, the bash client. And all we're gonna be doing is echoing hello from the Jenkins standard library. Um, and after we run that, we'll then look at the kind of things that the result object gives us. And we're going to run this twice. The first time is just going to be a regular command. And the second time is going to throw an error. And we'll be able to uh, catch that exception and also look at the things that the exception gives us to play with. So it behaves pretty much like the, the built-in shell step, right? We, we still see that the output is printed to the Jenkins console, um, but the result object that we get back has the standard output. It would have the standard error if there was any error, and it has output, which is both combined. And it also gives us the exit code, right? And then when we run the fake command, we, we see the error on the screen, and we get back the error and the output and the exit code. So that's like the first demo. So for the second one, we're going to run pretty much the exact same logic, but we're going to use the silent version, right? And this one's pretty handy because in a lot of the tooling that you build, maybe uh, in your shared library, you, you might not want all of this to go to the console output. You know, I've, I've gotten into several different Jenkins over the years and the console output is so long, you, you really can't, you know, it slows down the front end uh, and you can't find the useful information. So this is the exact same code running again, but now we don't see anything in the console except for what I've logged. So it's hidden that uh, from users. And for the third one, 
we're actually just going to ignore errors completely. So again, we're running the same kind of code that we've just ran the last several times. Uh, but this time, we don't have to set up a try catch block, right? We've eliminated the try catch block. You know, this is handy if you already know you're going to need to look at the exit code. Uh, and there we go. So we get the standard error. The standard output only contains, or, or the output only contains the standard error, and we get our exit code back. And the last little example I'll show you is again the same logic running again, but this time we're going to set a change the log level. So we've been running with info. We'll change the pipeline log level to debug. And this is something we use throughout the library to, you know, change the functionality of things, not just what's being printed, but actually change the functionality of whatever's being run. And this makes it really handy when you're debugging either a new pipeline that you're developing or a pipeline that has stopped working. So we see the debug output. And you're kind of getting a peek of what's going on you know, behind the scenes. And one of the things that's different and we're trying to, to solve is most of the tooling that we're installing relies on your shell sourcing either bash RC or bash profile. So a lot of tooling that you install these days, Pi environment, Ruby environment, any of those toolings like that are messing with your bash RC. Uh, and, you know, it's expecting you to source it when you interact with those tools. So we're sourcing Bash RC. But the other thing that we've done is now not only are we showing the output of the command, but we're also printing the actual command itself. So if you were using Bash variables here, this would be handy because it would um, it would interpolate those variables and expand them for you. And we get everything else that we've always been getting, the standard output, exit code, things like that. HTTP requests, it's increasingly common to interact with various services via API calls in our pipelines. So taking inspiration from Python's request module, I created a simple clone that would make it easier to make simple HTTP requests. And we'll take a quick look at some example requests before we get to the main event, which is GitHub Actions. So the code here again, is going to be pretty much the same. We're going to import the library and import the, the classes that we need. We're going to make a GET request to HTTP bin, and we're going to pass a map of parameters that we want to use in our request. And some of these are kind of listed where or nested where we have one parameter as a list. This one needs URL encoded because there's a space. We're going to make that GET request, and then we're going to inspect the response of that, that item. I feel like my, my mouse is going dead. It's real slow and jerky. All right, so we've made our HTTP request. And what we got back was a response body that was a JSON string. We got back a map of headers. But what's really cool is we got back a response.json, which is already a Groovy map. So that, that string body that was returned to us has already been transformed into a Groovy map ready for you to use. And if we look at the URL, you can see that it auto made the URL for us. We didn't have to manually uh, do all the parameters. The parameters was a map and it figured out all the parameters for us and it URL encoded everything for us. Now we have another example, it's use JSON. So not only can we of course receive JSON, but we can send JSON. So we're going to send it a Groovy map of JSON values, and it should take care of all the work for us by converting that to stringified JSON. So here we go. We get the response.body. It's a string. And if we look at the data field uh, from HTTP, it is our map that has been stringified. And then we get all the same, the response code, the is, is this an okay response? Things like that. And that was a post request, of course. And then the last thing, we have some authentication that it supports. We'll make these requests and we get back the is authenticated true for us. All right. So, 
why would you want to run GitHub Actions on Jenkins? Well, the first reason just might be that it has an amazing abstraction that you just give it this map of string inputs and it returns a map of string outputs. And when we look at plugins and compare them to plugins, plugins can take many types of inputs and it, they can behave in many types of ways. Another reason is that actions don't need to be installed or configured ahead of time. And depending on who or how your Jenkins is managed, this could be a huge benefit to your team. Actions also allow developers to write in whatever language they feel the most comfortable in. And this is probably the number one driver behind the huge explosive growth Actions has seen in the last year or two. Actually, one more. There we go. So ACT allows you to run your GitHub Actions workflow file locally. It even comes with advanced features, such as being able to simulate GitHub events like push and pull requests to trigger the proper workflow. As soon as I found this amazing project, my first thought was, would it run on Jenkins? So let's try it out. And let's take a look at the repo that we're going to be using. So this is an example repo. It's provided by the ACT team. It is like a little node, a little JavaScript uh, application. And this is the workflow file we'll be running. And it's, it's a pretty simple one. It checks out the code. It'll set up Node.js. It'll run npm install and npm test. So, so rather simple. And the code, again, just got the library imported. Um, so, so far, we haven't needed any plugins except for maybe the, the node plugin, which comes with pipelines to run the shell step. So, no other plugins have been used so far. Um, and we'll check out the, the, the little GitHub Actions demo repo that I just showed. And then we're just going to run Workflow. And Workflow is a really cheap and lazy wrapper I built one weekend. And so, it's going to call Act, and you can pass it a string. And anything you pass to it will get passed directly to the act binary. And it's just going to return a string of whatever string output would have come from that command. Oh, it's going to run and it's going to work, but this build will fail. And that's only because my Docker container is conflicting with the NPM server uh, that's running. So it's going to it's going to try to run this application in some kind of node server, and they're going to have a port conflict. But here you can see that ACT is doing its job. It's checking out code and then setting up NPM. It's going to pull down the dependencies, and then it's going to run some tests, and it's going to fail on the test step. Here we go. And if we go up to the top, uh, we should see the error. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're right here. Uh, address is in use, 8080. All right. So while running an entire workflow on Jenkins is cool, I soon realized that I didn't want to convert all of my existing Jenkins jobs to GitHub workflows. What I had really wanted was the ability to take a single action or two and inject them into an existing pipeline. So that would allow me to leverage the large number of GitHub actions available without installing additional plugins or building my own solution in Groovy. So let's see this action in action, I guess. So we got the action step imported. And this line right here is needed if you're doing some kind of like Docker and Docker, where I'm inside of a Docker container and I'm passing my socket to um, GitHub Actions, right? And I'm creating more containers. So if you aren't in doing Docker and Docker type stuff, you don't have to worry about this. Uh, but it is needed to make the solution work. So I have this stage called Docker Action. And if you've ever used Actions, then this syntax is probably familiar with you, right? This is the same thing that you would pass into a, a workflow step. So I'm just giving it the name, uh, which is a generic name that's displayed when it's run. I'm giving it a uses, which points to the action on Docker that I want to use and the version that I want to use. So it's basically a GitHub slug with the, the username, uh, the repo name, and then some kind of reference. And then with with, I'm passing it any parameters or variables that I want to use. And then that's it. I call it, and it's going to return a map of outputs, and we'll print that map. All 
All right, so check out. Go ahead. This is just awesome. Ah, thanks. And yeah, everything done uh, through pipeline library. Yes. So yeah, it's beyond my expectation what you could do with though with still a combination with plugins, because yeah, for syntax highlighting etc. But still, it's a nice concept. Yeah, yeah, and no plugins. There's no plugins used. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, we we check out the the action. It's a Docker container, so we build that container locally. Then we, you know, we have to map in like our current directory into the container. Uh, there's a whole like AWS or uh, AWS. There's a whole GitHub spec uh, specification document on how to build an action correctly. And then we just run it, hello Docker action. And then we get this map back. And one of the things it returned was an output called time, right? Now, this was pretty cool and it didn't take me that long to build, but turns out actions support several flavors. So we, it's not just Docker that we have to be able to run. We also have to be able to run JavaScript. So there's a JavaScript action and it looks pretty much the same thing. It's just gonna run the hello world action. These are, by the way, these actions that I'm running are just provided by, uh, they, they're, they're used in the tutorial from GitHub for how to build actions. So that's the actions that I'm using. And yeah, yep. we'll run this one. It should be the exact same experience. Yeah, one question, do you support the uh, container actions? So when you need to actually build Docker image uh, to execute the action? That's the one we just did. We built the Docker container. Oh, so JavaScript, et cetera, it's uh, still packages uh, container in this. Because yeah, in uh, GitHub actions, you have an option to run it without container. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Here it's always a container. Yeah, here, here it's always a container. So what I did for mm -hmm. um, the JavaScript one is I, I made it behave like a container. So instead of like actually installing Node locally, which I think they already have like Node installed on their runners, I'm just yes. wrapping, wrapping uh, whatever sent, whatever repo sent, I'm just injecting that into my own Node container and then running it. So here we go. And it works, it works behave, except for they put this event payload thing, which is not in, not in the Docker version, but it's in their JavaScript version, but it still gives us the time of the build. And then there's a third one, there's a composite action and a composite action is actually quite complicated. It's an action that can run like other action steps, but mainly when people use it, they're using this shell, they're using run and they're running bash commands. So in this example, we're gonna pass it some bash to run and it's going to set an output uh, in the map of outputs that are returned and the name will be test and the output will be some value. But this could be anything. And I actually really like this one because you could take a really long complicated legacy bash script that your company has and you can add some outputs to it because a lot of times that's what we just want. We, we have multiple spots uh, in the bash script and we're just like, man, I wish I could have whatever this output is into uh, an easy to use variable. And so now that makes it a lot easier because you can inject it into a map. So here we go. We, oh, I think I ran the wrong one. Did I run both or just one? Sorry about that. All right. And actually, the advantage of this approach is that you can also use uh, Jenkins parallelization features. Yeah. Because yeah, you still have full control. And. Yeah. Yeah, maybe one question about the implementation. So basically you run uh, everything on the agent side, right? So yeah. when you execute within node context, it's of a agent, it's not execution, it can come the controller. Yeah, was you asking me? Uh, yeah, so when you run a GitHub uh, action, so you execute it uh, on the node, and basically it executes using a Docker engine on this node. Yeah. So it's not uh, executing on the controller. No, yeah, it, oh, it definitely works on agents, yes. Yeah, yep. and, uh, uh, was asking just in case because not all uh, Jenkins plugins behave in such way, especially for Kubernetes, for Docker it's a bit uh, easier. Uh, but yeah, uh, thanks for clarification. Yep. So we, yeah, we run the script and we're able to set the output and get the output back. Um, another thing I, was, I wanted to show.
we'll run the first one again, the Docker action again, but we'll take advantage of that pipeline log level for debugging. Because again, most of the things we build respect that uh, and can change the functionality of what's happening. I think for this one, I haven't implemented um, where it won't delete the running container. It'll leave the container up for inspection. Um, but that's something that I want to implement uh, in the future is when you run it in debug, and if you run debug during this build, it'll keep this container up so that you can access it and mess with it. So what we're seeing in green is like, it's looking at the metadata file and the metadata file tells you how to run this action. So it says, hey, I'm expecting these inputs and here's the default value and here's the uh, outputs and what they are and here's how to run me. And this is the args that I want. So we're, we're parsing this and handling all this. Um, and then here's the build, the build log and the actual script that we run, and then, then the output. So if we come back uh, and hit replay, we should be able to remove like who to greet. I've actually never did this, so I probably shouldn't do it live. Uh, but it should say hello world. It should, because we're parsing that file and, and handling everything so that behaves exactly like a GitHub action would if you ran it on uh, GitHub Actions. So there, did I, what did I do this time? I'm having like this uh, weird sync issue. Do you see this, Oleg, where I'm, I'm running, but it's running like a previous job? All right, hello world. So we got the default value back. And yeah, I mean, that's it. A, a big thank to the Jenkins community and CDCon and everyone involved for making these amazing events possible. And if anyone else besides Oleg has questions, well, I'll be taking them for the next 10 minutes. Yeah, so thanks a lot for this presentation. I think it should go straight to the Jenkins online meetup. Because yeah, I believe that uh, it will be a really good session uh, for users, and uh, I wish that we could even make this uh, library more official, or maybe talk a bit uh, with the GitHub teams, etc. Because yeah, it's a really nice concept, and actually it uh, provides a lot of powers uh, to Jenkins. So for me, as an individual contributor, uh, I would be definitely interested to promote that. And I definitely see many users adopting this approach, even on the Jenkins infrastructure, because we have an open question, for example, how do we integrate the release drafter um, with uh, Jenkins pipelines? We have our own solution, uh, but uh, I think that we could just use your library to trigger this uh, GitHub action, though it actually leads to one question is about passing credentials and secrets. So do you just pass them through environment or do you have some kind of automation in your library? So I haven't looked into using any kind of credentials yet, but you're definitely going to, like most GitHub actions is going to want to hit your, the GitHub API and do yeah. things with it. So I haven't tackled that yet, but I was going to test it. I'm pretty sure for now you could wrap that in with environment, right? Or like uh, with credentials, right? Yeah. So, so Credentials binding plugin uh, together with uh, mapping, uh, but yeah, you would uh, ideally it should be inside uh, the library, so that uh, users don't uh, use it outside and they could pass uh, in the declarative way, like uh, in a, uh, basically GitHub step GitHub action step definition. So you could say that I want to pass uh, these secrets and that's it. Yeah, it's definitely something uh, we could do. Um, so in order not to break yeah. like the GitHub API, you would probably want to do something like uh, action dot, uh, you know, credentials, right? And set mm -hmm. some kind of credentials ID. Yep. Or whatever they are, I don't know if they're integers or strings, but yeah, you'd have to set some kind of credentials ID and then it could inject because in, uh, you know, with GitHub API, it's just, uh, it's just secrets. I think yes. it's a secret. So yeah, we could inside the library inject the secret for sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's uh, really nice. And uh, so if somebody wants to contribute to this library, what would be the recommended way? Uh, do you already have a license uh, or contributing guidelines? Well, I know the answer because I asked for that, uh, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, so you have, yeah. Yeah, so, um, man, let me find it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the license, I think I picked like GPL V3. That's probably like one of my weakest things was trying to understand licensing and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I tried to pick one that made it easy for anyone to use and take. And I think the only downside to GPL is that you can't bundle it with other code. So maybe that affects what you were saying about getting it integrated with another project, but we can probably just change it. Um, and then... Yep. And then for contributing, there's a contributing doc. Uh, doc. Um, I just wrote it and I've never tried it. So uh, I'm not exactly how close it'll be to, to your experience, but it should be pretty easy to get up and running um, because the project itself is actually using, you know, it's using Gradle, but it also uses uh, pre-commit in Python. So actually the testing setup is quite weird um, because I'm not like having, I don't have a really, strong background in Java. So Gradle and Maven, I try to stay away from. But I wasn't happy with the, there's the two main testing frameworks in, in Jenkins, right? There's Jenkins Spock, and then there's another Jenkins um, like pipeline or something, I can't remember. I, I didn't, neither one of those would do the things that I needed to do. And because like, for instance, I have the logging thing, right? And I needed to test like, did the logging work, but from a user perspective. So none of those returned to me like the raw logging of the actual job. It didn't return to me the Jenkins console. And because I'm doing things that manipulate the console, I needed a different way to run it. So all my tests are using the Jenkins file runner, which I think Oleg, you're, you're definitely familiar with. Yeah, uh, kind of. So what I've done is I have my tests written out for each package and each class. And then what I'm doing is I'm starting a Jenkins file runner. So I have this um, PyTest, uh, this thing's got a, a fixture is what it's called in PyTest. But this is just passed into my test and it's a function and it acts like a decorator. So it returns a function, but it's returning this run test function. But all it's doing is creating a container running Jenkins file runner. So it creates the container, the container is running and it passed that container back to the test function. So here's the run test. And what I do is I pass it the path to the job I want to run. So all of my tests are actually defined as real Jenkins jobs that can run on any Jenkins. So you can take any of my, my test jobs, throw them into your Jenkins after you install the Jenkins standard library and they'll all run and pass. Um, so yeah, I get the container running. And then when you run run test, it's just running the exec command on that existing container. Right, and it's uh, it's it's pointing to the job path and running that single job. So I'll show you the test, so that makes a little bit more sense. And then I'll show you what the actual test looked like, because the Python is just basically passing in the name. I'll show you the logging one, so it makes a little bit more sense why I needed such a weird testing uh, environment. So here, um, my container is that uh, function I just showed you, and when I what I'm passing to it is the path to the job that I want to run. So here it's going to run logging, logging example. And the job mm -hmm. output that I get back is the actual role Jenkins console, which a lot of the other testing plugins wouldn't give me. So here I can say, hey, is this here? And then I can change the level and say, is this here? I can change the level again and say, is this here? And so that's what we're seeing here. Yep. Yeah. And then it's if I- pretty good. Huh? No, no, just looking at it's really nice implementation because, yeah, I work a lot on test automation of uh, uh, pipeline libraries, and uh, I see that Victor is also quite interested in uh, what you're doing because, yeah, Victor uh, also uh, did a lot of hardcore automation, including Jenkins pipeline library. Yeah. Yeah, so I really like this approach, though we are still yet to in, uh, implement the Jenkins file runner based test automation. And actually, there was even a session. Uh, tentatively scheduled for the today's summit about testing pipeline libraries, I believe, with this Jenkins file runner. 
but we haven't uh, got enough uh, quorum uh, to uh, get this session running. Yeah, I, I created yeah. this library about a year ago, but I didn't really want to do much with it unless I got it tested to the level where I felt comfortable with telling people like, yes, you can use this. It's legit, it won't break on you. Um, and I really struggled with the testing. I found Jenkins file runner, but I struggled with getting it running. So I actually put this away for like six months. And then I had some time around Thanksgiving holidays in, in the US. And I went back to work on it and got, got this kind of strung together. And yeah, so this is this is that same job, the, the logging example. And I use this as like documentation on how to use things and as tests. Um, and so like I got this weird stuff, you know, like you have to worry about pipeline CPS. So I, I'm always triggering like uh, different CPS stuff like shell scripts at the beginning and end of my test to make sure that anything I write is going to be CPS compliant. It's not going to mess anyone up. But here's that uh, logging logic. And the logging logic is kind of boring. Uh, some of the other logic that I have is a little bit better. So like if we check out mm -hmm. uh, the request library, um, you'll see like I make a get request, but then I really start hammering into, OK, is the response OK? Does the JSON that it returns, is it the correct JSON? Mm -hmm. um, all that. So it, it, it's, it's kind of heavily tested. And then some of the code, uh, like maybe Bash, no, um, Actions. Actions is the most recent code I wrote. So yeah, some of it, I'm actually trying to write unit tests as well. So I got the example jobs, which are like my functional tests, but then like I'll come in here and I'll, I'll create little, little tiny tests for individual functions. So, you know, is this returning, uh, is this one is if it throws the right error, right? So if, did you put something in that you shouldn't have put, you know, we can test for that. Um, so this, I added an if, right? Cause you can do ifs inside of GitHub actions. So I'm testing that it skips jobs like it should, things like that. So it's a weird, it's a weird uh, testing workflow. It doesn't take that much to get set up. So if you have Docker, um, and uh, I think I got everything in like just a requirements file inside the test directory. Yep. So yeah. if you could run uh, pip install in a virtual environment, you can run PyTest and it should run all these tests and they should all pass. Um, and I, I have a Docker. So by default, it uses my Docker image, uh, but there's mm -hmm. steps in the contributing guide if you want to build your own. Um, and maybe Oleg, that's a conversation that we can have about the Jenkins file runner because I still to this day cannot get it running. I stole your stuff from CI. Don't you have like a CI dot Jenkins file runner repo? Uh, we have some CI uh, for integrate, but integration testing uh, that is quite weak. No, no, no. And, that's, uh, you yeah. have uh, you have yeah, CI Jenkins CIO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's the Docker file I'm running. I came in and installed that Docker file because I couldn't get it running myself. Um, and so this is this is that Docker file, but I have script everything out that I didn't, that I thought I could. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so for that, uh, I have for the lightweight container in recent versions, which is based on the GDK 11, uh, basically JRE from adopter from GDK. So the entire container weights something like 140 megabytes in Jenkins file runner. Yes. Yeah, and it's uh, the most uh, stripped uh, version you can get at the moment. Uh, well, unless I know how to remove 20 more megabytes. But it wasn't, won't be that pleasant uh, for Jenkins stability. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I stripped out a lot of that and got it down to like 700 megs, but I think it could be smaller. I just mean like, I mean, you should talk later about that repo and, and the readme and the instructions in it, because I have some ideals on how to make it super easy for anyone to use Jenkins file runner. I think it's kind of complex right now if you're not from Java and you don't know what wars are and you don't know how to build Gradle build. It's quite complicated. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, speaking of that, actually, I was wondering how much of your framework we could reuse, uh, because uh, in Jenkins File Runner, maybe you have seen there is a project called uh, Jenkins File Runner Test Harness, which is uh, written in uh, SH Unit Two, basically. Uh, but yeah, it's quite heavy weight as well. Uh, if you want, I can just screen share show it to you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you can take it. Uh, yeah. That shouldn't have any secret. Can I stop the recording right before we go on a tangent? No, you can uh, skip recording. I will show just my screen. Uh, okay. So again, I haven't cleaned up my windows. So if you see something weird, uh, we will clean it up. But yeah, right now there is just a lot of memes. 
Uh, so yeah, I'm going uh, to GitHub, and here there is a pro. Uh, is it Firefox. I have nothing cached in Firefox because I was testing uh, one patch uh, by Gavin, and I had to uh, rest up as a clean. Uh, so yeah, there is main Jenkins file runner, but there is also yeah, one Jenkins file runner GitHub actions, uh, which is not quite active, and the Jenkins file runner test framework. So this was a original prototype, which was created by um, Evarista Hernandez and sorry, Evarista and uh, Fran. Uh, we work together in a team. This framework is basically built around uh, uh, custom work package for images, uh, and uh, it uses um, SH Unit 2, but it was built for very old versions of Jenkins File Runner, which are quite heavy. So this framework is also quite heavyweight, and I was when I was uh, rebuilding uh, unit testing, I moved the most of the tests from this framework to actually just unit tests. Uh, so uh, currently, if you go to Jenkins File Runner, uh, what I have here um, is that, uh, yeah, so it's still an incubating project, but yeah, whatever. So there is slim packaging right now, and it's really slim. So it gets you 140 megabyte images. Um, and you still can uh, run tests, for, for example, for vanilla package. What you can see here, it's probably not the state of the art implementation, but still. So there is a smoke test. And actually, this smoke test allows uh, to connect to Jenkins instance and to verify everything using standard uh, Jenkins test harness framework. But you can also run a Jenkins file runner uh, with all the features like JCASC, etc., just by uh, uh, passing such configuration files. Obviously, it can be prettified, but it's a JUnit test at the moment. Gotcha. So, for okay. some kind of tests, it might be easier to do it this way. Or, but yeah, I understand that for real integration tests, it might be actually preferable to have your framework. Maybe have some equivalent of Jenkins file runner test framework, maybe Jenkins file runner test framework 2.0, which would actually be built around the um, more complicated test framework, because this one needs to be reworked uh, for modern packaging. So custom work packager now is optional for Jenkins file runner. And the custom work package still needs to be updated uh, to support the recent versions efficiently. I cannot do that because of, uh, let's say, non-technical non reasons, uh, but uh, somebody can build it around that, so around Slim packaging. We currently integrate the uh, Jenkins plugin manager right inside the image. It's a CLI tool. So you can uh, actually build a test framework uh, around that uh, and uh, make it generic enough. So what you did for your library, but maybe something we could reuse, for example, for uh, uh, Jenkins uh, pipeline library. I'm not sure whether you have seen this project. No. Uh, so Jenkins Infra, we have our own pipeline library, which we use, uh, well, surprise, uh, uh, for testing of Jenkins. Uh, so it uh, reduces uh, our pipelines to one-liners for building standard pipelines, uh, standard plugins. Uh, and yeah, it's uh, actually quite complicated inside at the moment. So Victor uh, has invested a lot of time into creating uh, a Jenkins pipeline unit based test, but it's a Jenkins pipeline unit. We don't have integration tests there at the moment. And uh, yeah, I made an attempt uh, actually to integrate a uh, Jenkins uh, test hardness, I believe. It was somewhere here. Well, yeah, it was somewhere. Did I close it? Mm, yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, anyway, so there was a pull request which could integrate the Jenkins file runner in this. Uh, uh, am I blind? Oh, I'm blind. So yeah, basically the point here that it required some patches on uh, uh, the library side, but it allowed to actually run a Jenkins file runner test. And I believe that he had a demo for that. Uh, yeah, so make file, which basically 
uh, advanced integration tests in this library. So here you can see that I'm using Jenkins Hello Runner test framework. So it's basically around SH unit two. And this is, was quite a problem for me because yeah, it uh, requires native Docker, etc. So it requires quite uh, heavy resources uh, to test it. And I would rather prefer something like wait uh, without uh, maybe even Docker at all. Uh, but yeah, this is a framework, how it looks like in practice. So it was uh, running uh, two uh, smoke tests. It's doing some setup uh, and it was testing the build plugin step. So it was basically building the image with Maven with all tools embedded uh, to emulate our CI Jenkins IO environment. Uh, you can see that I also had to keep Windows builds. So I had to patch actually our production to test it, but it was running. So I was able to do integration tests for uh, while using this old framework. And I think that with uh, modern approaches, it would have been much easier because SH unit two is designed for testing bash. And it's not exactly the most friendly framework for testing uh, in general. So yeah, I think that uh, your framework could fit uh, this use case quite well. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So uh, again, uh, yeah. So this was created um, quite a, a while ago. Uh, I was unable uh, to finish it again due to non-technical reasons. Uh, I have to pronounce it too often when I talk about Jenkins file runner, unfortunately, but uh, yeah. So just a sharing because uh, yeah, the thing is there and if somebody wants to take it over, you're welcome to do so, it's open source. Cool. Oh, nice thing, Andre. Yeah, I just wanna say as well that I really like what you just saw, is the way that you present the idea of this objects that you can use on the GitHub Actions. Um, what I see is just a question regarding how you foresee in the future, the way you can, I really like the idea of the GitHub Actions. And the more I hear from my users, how they use the CI, the more I realized the benefit from GitHub Action is the usability. Uh, that it seems like they like more this YAML, though I don't like much. Um, so in terms of, how to make the usability easier. Uh, have you thought about uh, the files will leave always there as any GitHub workflows and the pipeline to be consuming these files rather than defining them in the declarative file, sorry, in, in the pipeline itself, like consuming these files that are more probably easy to read from the user point of view rather than adapting the changes in the pipeline itself if it makes any sense. Yeah, I think I was, I was kidding you. You're talking about like almost hiding the Jenkins from the user, right? And just having them worry about uh, the, the workflow file. Yeah, I think that would work. I mean, that's kind of how this whole thing came about. I was working for uh, a machine learning team that works on self-driving cars. And I think they were a little bit unhappy with their infrastructure team and some of the things with Jenkins. So they were wanting to run um, GitHub Actions, but they were unable to. And so I just kind of started Googling around, like, hey, can, can I, can I, is anyone trying this? And no one was trying it. And it wasn't that hard to put together. Um, so I think that's a use case. I mean, there's going to be people that um, are, are kind of stranded, and on, they feel like they're stranded on Jenkins, and, and they want to move somewhere else but can't. And now we, you can bring some features to them that that's easier for them to use. Um, and then I think on a second, like the other thing might be, well, maybe we just want to make it easier for our users. So we can create a couple, um, you know, a generic library function that just checks out the user's code and then runs the user's action, right? That's all we have to maintain in Groovy. Um, and then they can, you know, trigger it from their, uh, from their, from their GitHub and, and run the, the job. So I think that's part of it. For me, um, I wanted to just reach out and leverage a action here and there where maybe I couldn't find the correct plugin, but I could find the action. And I was like, man, if only I could just run that action. I already have this pipeline built. It's already really nice and robust, um, but I just need that one action. And I really just don't want to recreate it all in Groovy, especially if it's like for one, one, one thing that I know I'm never going to use again. Um, so yeah, there's a couple different use cases. 
And I certainly hope people use it because right now it's like me and two friends. So. Uh, uh, as I say, uh, really great job. And uh, I'm willing to listen more about this. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can go on and on. Uh, I, I think we just had a really good conversation about Jenkins X and interoperability and um, wh where is all this going? Where's CI and CD going? And what will it look like in 10 years? And it was definitely different in opinions there. Uh, some people on that call were like, we'll all be YAML pipelines and real simple pipelines in the future. And then there's people like me I've worked with a lot of legacy stuff, a lot of complicated stuff, long learning, ML builds. And for me, I'm like, you know, I, I'm not sure I want to do everything in Bash and YAML. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of like having the full term complete language at my disposal. And I know I can build anything I need that I come across and it won't take me that long. And there's definitely like a middle ground. And that's probably where GitHub Actions is, is, you know, you define it in Bash and YAML. But when you run it, all the steps are built in some kind of high level language that the, that developer wanted. Um, and that's definitely part of its growth was one, it was very close to your source code. Uh, so it makes it easy to see the build and have visibility into the build. Um, and then two, they can, they, any developer can write whatever action they want in the language of their choice. Um, but I don't think, like, I don't think we're going down a road where, like, if Jenkins doesn't switch to Bash, it's obsolete, Bash and YAML. Just because if you look at vehicles, you know, we've had over a hundred years now for vehicles to just look like one shape and they don't. So you got different, different vehicles, right? Different cars, trucks, vans, buses for different, different needs. And I think that's what we'll see uh, is when you're doing simpler pipelines like Kubernetes where you can deploy with kubectl, and your pipeline is not that complicated, you can probably do everything in YAML and Batch. I've had these really crazy pipelines that, you know, you're, you're building applications and then you're triggering builds and or a bunch of other builds for a bunch of other teams in the same organization to make sure that their stuff works with your application. And then once all those results come back, you know, you're, you're looking at test results and they have to be a certain amount. And then you're going out and you're making a, a service now ticket and you have to wait till the RIB board approves your deployment a month later. And I built those kind of crazy pipelines and I would never try to do that in Bash. And, and that kind of stuff doesn't really work with GitHub Actions. So definitely it's an interesting space right now. Yeah, I have the same sympathy with you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, okay. can I ask a small question? Uh, uh, this uh, GitHub action thing is uh, really impressive and I definitely can see a use case here, but uh, your shared library is a nugget. Uh, and I think I will look into it. Uh, I think I can use it right now. Uh, but uh, how in Jenkins log there are usually um, a great a grayed out uh, text uh, which states that uh, like I'm going to execute echo step I'm going to execute a sage step and but your logs looks very clean uh, how did you hide all that uh, stuff ah uh, yes with a plugin. Um... So yeah, in the readme, I talk about how to make your Jenkins look like my Jenkins. Um, so it's the simple theme plugin and it basically allows you to manipulate the CSS in the GUI. And so there's two classes, pipeline hyphen annotated and pipeline hyphen new node. And I just set display to none and then they disappear. So if you like go in your Jenkins log right now and like you know, hit F12 to bring up the dev tools. Mm -hmm. You can set those uh, classes to display none and you'll get a really clean output. Um, yeah, I, I, one of the things that kills me is opening up someone's Jenkins log and it's like thousands and thousands of kilobytes long, maybe 30 or 50 or 100 and the Jenkins GUI nearly crashes and you're trying to scroll through, you know, some giant C make build 
uh, looking for like the one thing that's important, that kind of stuff kills me. So uh, when I teach Jenkins, I try to teach people that, you know, when, you, when you're trying to build this pipeline, you're the user, like make it nice for yourself because no one else will. Um, so make these usability features that, that help like the debug, when you flip that log level to debug, you should, your tools should behave with it. So I have a bunch of stuff I haven't added to the library because of time. I actually just got the testing kind of stuff working in February and I added a couple of things. And then I started working on the GitHub action stuff like two months ago, but I have a lot of stuff I want to add to the library. Things like uh, I wrote, I have a Terra, Terraform client that deploys Terraform code, super sweet. You, you know, things like uh, I have a Packer wrapper that will allow you to build Packer AMIs. And when you turn on debug and run the job, Packer will not delete the AMI when it's done, the image when it's done, like uh, the running one. So if you have a failed build, you turn on debug, you run it a second time, and the image stays up. So you can SSH into it and figure out why did your build fail inside of uh, the Packer instance. So just making your tools really um, easier to use for us, because we were the users, and, and they, they should be a pleasant experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I opened uh, your repo uh, on my uh, personal computer and I put a star on it uh, oh. <laughs> because it's really great. Yeah, I see uh, the readme section with uh, which hiding these messages. Unfortunately, I, I thought there's a way to hide uh, output from selected steps, right? So from uh, regular pipeline code, I actually want these messages, uh, but uh, we have some pipeline functions that uh, uses uh, maybe echo step a lot, maybe is Unix uh, step a lot, and you see this uh, wall of text and the logs. Um, it's it can so, be can it it's cluttering. It can be really confusing. So yeah. So for that, there is a plugin that was never published. So it, I don't know if I'll be able to find it or if you'll be able to find it, but there was a plugin someone wrote that they never published that did that. You could, it was, uh, mm -hmm. it was a, a groovy closure and it would kill all out, output to the, the console. Mm -hmm. I do know the name of the plugin. I found it years ago, years ago. And because it wasn't published to, to Jenkins and I, you know, I didn't know, I didn't even know how to pull it down locally and build it and then install it. Uh, to Jenkins, so mm -hmm. I never used it, but it was it, it did work, and there was like you know there was like issues where people were like, hey, you should publish this and yada yada yada. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know the name. Uh, I'll Google search it, and, and maybe if I find it later, uh, I'll reach out. So it is on GitHub, right? Yes, it is on GitHub. So I can probably try to find it. I'll okay, thank you very the much. countdown uh, because we need to, to drop. Uh, but uh, yeah. Oops. <laughs> 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 All right. Did I, I interrupt everyone? <laughs>